Hello and welcome back this week uh, to Consumer Behavior with Dr. Greer. I am so excited to have this conversation with you. Tonight we're gonna be, or today, excuse me, we're gonna be talking about uh, product positioning and motivation. And the second half is my favorite topic in the world. It's chapter 10. I actually did my dissertation on what motivates people and authentic leadership essentially is what it was. So I could talk for hours. I'm not gonna bore you to death with that though. We're gonna try and get through this relatively quickly, get you the information you need and get you out. So let's go ahead and start in chapter nine. <clears throat> Learning, memory, and product positioning. So there are lots of concepts in this chapter that you can go ahead and read through. Um, I'm gonna try and just do a high level overview of a bunch of it and then let you do the reading in order to get the most of that out of here. So we are in stage three, part three of this um, frame, which is internal influences. And so we've moved into what's in someone's head, essentially, which is a great part, because I think this is, like I said last week, where all the magic happens. We're gonna talk about the nature of learning memory, uh, how to figure out the differences between high and low involvement learning, and then we're gonna talk about how people recover those thoughts and memories that they have, and then how we can use all this information for positioning. So let's just look really quickly at the information processing system uh, and the phase. So when we see when someone is starting to ingest information, what happens is during the learning process, they perceive something or they're exposed to it. And then it goes into short-term memory um, after the exposure, they get to interpret and transfer that information, and then they store it or they put it into that long-term memory. Now, let's we'll, we'll talk about what those mean exactly because there's there's some definitive concepts here. So, our memory has two interrelated components. The first one is short-term memory or STM, and this is our working memory. This is something that you're probably using right now. Um, you are listening to me and let's be honest, like 20 years from now, you're gonna remember what I said, I hope, but it might not go into your long-term memory. So what our short-term memory is pretty amazing that we have these two things. Like our brain knows that we can't absorb everything. So the brain actually has a couple different sections of it ready to kind of put something in. And then if it needs to be cataloged, it'll shove it back into long-term memory, but you know, it has to decide whether or not it needs to be used. So. Our long-term memory, or LTM, uh, is devoted to permanent information storage. Now, if you were to ask me what date my birth or my wife's birthday is, I'd tell you it's February seventh, and that is in my long-term memory. That is not in a short-term memory bank. All right, I don't want to forget that. So we have two different types of long-term memory. One is semantic memory, and it's the basic knowledge and feelings that an individual has about a concept. And then there's episodic memory, which is the memory of a sequence of events in which a per, like you participated in. So we can remember the feelings we had, what was going on. We can remember, like, um, if you think back to an, a great experience that you've had in your life, you can usually remember, like, oh, and then so-and-so did this. And then, oh, when I threw the ball, they caught it and they did that and all that kind of stuff. Whereas we also have a memory about a concept like the feelings that we have about the concept. So if I was to ask you, you know, what is your thought of Hillary Clinton? Or what is your thought of Donald Trump? You might actually automatically pull some knowledge and feelings that you have out of your brain about one of those two individuals and say, oh, well, this is how I feel about that person. So um, yeah, memory is important. <clears throat> so our STM is short lived. It, you know, if we don't keep things going in there, then they'll just be forgotten. Uh, I am really bad with numbers. Like if you told me my number is 801-555-0111, I'd forget it. <laughs> it just doesn't work. My short-term memory is not made very well for numbers. However, when I meet somebody, it like I can usually recall names pretty fast. Um, I'm really good at seeing somebody 20 years later and being like, I know that person. And it usually comes up, I'm like, oh, that's, that's Stan. And I knew him at this, I met him one time at a conference or something like that. <clears throat> so it's interesting to me how they, they, you know, my STM and LTM work differently. Um, our STM has limited capacity. Uh, consumers can only hold so much information in current memory. And if you're a computer geek like I am, a good way to look at this is a hard drive and RAM. So your short-term memory is the RAM 
and your long-term memory is the hard drive. So if you're into computers, that helps you out a little bit. Um, our elaborative activities serve to redefine and add new elements to memory and can involve both concepts and imagery. So when we see things, we can actually adjust them and be like, oh, that made an impact or didn't based upon um, how we viewed something. So our long-term memory or schematic memory scripts and how to retrieve as we're going to talk about these three things. Our long-term memory is a pretty fascinating thing and I actually think it's one of the more powerful tools, tools that our human brain gives us. We're going to learn how to use that against people in marketing <laughs> or use it to help educate them. Now if we looked at a partial schematic memory for Mountain Dew, if I was to ask you what does Mountain Dew mean to you, this is kind of like one of those brain clouds of where we'll just see what people come up with. So crisp, fun, green, cool. Uh, well, when I think of crisp, I think of carbonated, refreshing, and lemonade, okay? When I think of fun, I think of parties and music, and last party I attended, I, uh, when I think about that, there was Kim that was there. When I think about being cool, it's extreme, which is Sean White, which is spelled wrong because it's S-H-A-U-N, so they did that wrong in here. But you notice that like we have these like tangents that come off, and we, we can run those things through, and that shows us what our long-term memory is doing. We can kind of riff on things because one thing can lead us to another based in that, in that interesting area of our brain. Now, we learn in high and low involvement. And so if there's a situation that involves high involvement, then we get conditioned and it goes into our cognitive brain. And so our learning approach can be either conditioning or cognitive. And the same thing can happen with a low involvement, okay? But typically, low involvement learning leads to conditioning, which leads to learning in a classical theory. We'll talk about all these theories here in a minute. I have a, um, I have a table for us to look at. Whereas if we look at a cognitive high learning or high involvement learning situation, we usually wanna be using reasoning and analogy. Whereas low involvement learning situation Cognitive goes up to the iconic route, and we'll talk about and the uh, vicarious modeling. So we're going to look at all these and describe what those are. So let's just really quickly just touch on some theories that we need, which is classical conditioning is the process of using an established relationship between one stimulus, music, and the re and response, pleasant feelings, to bring about the learning of the same response, pleasant feelings, to a different stimulus or brand. So uh, a good way to explain this is when I left. California for Utah. The day before I um, left, I actually married one of my friends and his wife. And so I was the officiant. And they played um, Ed Sheeran's perfect song at their wedding rehearsal. And there was just, he had played it a bunch. And anyway, they had it that night. And it was a pretty emotional night. I was leaving California <coughs> and I was leaving my best friend who I just married. And it was, it was a lot of fun stuff, right? But when I hear that Ed Sheeran song, I instantly think about that evening and the emotions that I had that evening doing that. Now, we can do the same thing when we use a song in marketing that potentially has a really positive experience with someone and we put it in our commercial. We automatically, that person infers that same feeling of positivity or sorrow or whatever we wanna project onto the new brand that we're introducing to them. So that's pretty powerful. Now, uh, operant conditioning or instrumental learning involves rewarding desirable behaviors such as brand purchases with a positive outcome. I'm sure everybody here has bought a burrito or a salad at Costa Vida or Cafe Rio. And they give you a receipt and what do you do with it? You scan it in your phone, you get that little instant high of, oh, I'm earning points, at least I can earn points. And so it's reinforcing that, hey, come back and eat. Um, every time you do, you're gonna get points. Very typical. So we can shape people uh, with in that operant conditioning. So we can tell them to consume a free sample of rice popcorn that was sent to your house. Then you can purchase a second package using a discount coupon that accompanied the free sample. And then the third stage is they would repurchase the product at full price. So we can actually kind of get through people and teach them to do that. This is very similar to uh, a timeshare, right? Like get someone to take a free trip, then get them to maybe buy a weekend and then get them to buy the whole thing, okay? So you can, you can have them have experiences that teach them to do that. 
Now, when we're looking at high and low involvement learning, we have cognitive learning, which involves iconic rote learning, vicarious learning modeling, and analytic reasoning. Now, let's talk about these three things. There's this great table, table 9-1. <clears throat> if you want to look at these three different things, we can go down to the bottom here. So iconic rote is a concept or, so, uh, or the association between two concepts is learned without conditioning. So you can teach them that without conditioning them. A high involvement example is a consumer with little expertise about Blu-ray players tries really hard to brand information, uh, tries to learn brand information by examining it carefully several times. Learning is limited, however, because of his or her lack of expertise, they inhibit elaboration. So they're like, I don't know too much, but I'm going to learn as much as I can about this. I'm going to elaborate on it based upon what I've got here. And then a low involvement example of that is a consumer learns that a company's most recent jingle um, because it's catchy and can't stop replaying it in his or her head. I think I've told this story already, but <clears throat> my son one day asked me to take him to, I said, hey, let's go out to eat tonight. Where do you want to go? And he said, I want to go to IHOP. And I was just confused. I was like, we had never gone to IHOP before. And I said, but why would you want to go to IHOP? And he looks at me and just said, dad, because when at IHOP, when you come hungry, you leave happy. <laughs> And I was like, wow, they got my kid. They totally got him with a TV commercial. So, you know, that's an interesting aspect of how we can start putting things into their brains. Now, just as an interesting point, he was probably 10 at that time. Fast forward, he's now 21 next month. So it's almost been 11 years. We've probably gone to IHOP 100 times in that time period which would not have happened if he had not done that because we had never gone to IHOP before that as a family. So that's an interesting little way of how effective was that. Let's just put a price tag of $40 on every visit. I did 100 visits. We're talking about $4,000 that they made with that one jingle just with my family alone. Imagine how many people had that. So as marketers, we want consumers to learn and remember the positive features, feelings, and behaviors associated with our brands that we're giving them. So if someone forgets about us, you know, what are we going to do? Um, we, we don't want them to forget. So they might have a retrieval failure, information that can't be available in the LTM that cannot be retrieved, so our long-term memory has to be there. Or we could have extinction because we didn't make it into their long-term memory. Maybe the desired response decays out and just gets forgotten about. Um, I don't know if you've ever done this, but... Like I go through waves, I'm a big Fresca guy. Okay, so I love Fresca. And for a little bit I was drinking root beer and Sprite. And I kind of forgot about Fresca. And then I was like, you know, I, I'm not enjoying this as much. I wish I had my Fresca one day. And then I went back and started buying it. But it's really easy to have consumers forget about you for unintentional reasons. So let me show you this little learning curve. <clears throat> I think this is fascinating. So over time, uh, if someone sees a magazine advertisement, there's 100% retention the day of, of the magazine ad, um, advertisement. Now, unaided recall is still pretty high, but notice that after about a week and three days, that unaided recall just goes below that 50%. Half of the people don't remember it. Aided recall, giving them something else to look at actually bumps up almost you know 10 percent and it continues so we can see why it would be important to keep putting things in people's memory my uh, my youngest son actually had an interesting observation last week we were watching tv together and he said to me he goes dad why does progressive sell insurance he goes it doesn't really seem like they're selling insurance and i said what do you mean and he said well I don't know, they don't really ever talk about what they're doing. And I thought, wow, that's pretty fascinating that my son was recognizing at that point that there's a big brand play on Progressive. And I would say Geico probably also. Those two companies really compete in Allstate just in that insurance thing, but trying to just stay top of mind all the time. So when we're talking about these three concepts of learning, memory, and retrieval, there's the strength of learning, there's memory interference, and then there's a response environment. So <clears throat> strength of learning is enhanced by six factors. How important is it? How involved is the message? What's the mood? What's the reinforcement? How often does it come? And then dual coding, putting it in in two different ways. And so we want to look at how we can have massive amounts of impact with learning. 
and, and with bringing that awareness up. So if we have repetition on brand awareness for high and low awareness brands, uh, the green line is four ad insertions every four weeks. So they're seeing it once a week, or I'm sorry, four times every week and for four weeks. And it looks like on high and low that we have much, well, the, the brand retention is very high. The percentage of gain is pretty impressive compared to the other ones. And last semester we had a conversation <coughs> in the class that was, would you, if Nike stopped endorsing and advertising, how long do you think it would be till they started declining in brand share and there would be a different shoe company? We had people that said, I will always buy Nikes. And <laughs> we had people that said, I'd forget about them in a day. <clears throat> and I, I simply think that we can't, we can't assume that everyone's gonna remember us as marketers. So we do need to stay in there in front of them in order to remind them that it needs to happen. Now, when we look at if we did a lot of advertising and we stopped, there's a rapid reduction in how many people remember us. Whereas if we do spontaneous advertising over a long time period, that's the blue line, we can see that the retention is much higher, especially after about 26 weeks. So that's where we need to be like, okay, now you could run an ad campaign where you blitz tons of commercials up front and then you start staggering it. That might actually change this curve. But memory interference occurs when consumers have difficulty retrieving a specific piece of information because of other related information that's in the memory that gets in the way. Have you ever been thinking like, oh, what was the name of that restaurant? Oh, I can't remember. There's McDonald's and Wendy's. and Oh, what was that one? I can't remember that one. That happens quite often to people. So um, as people see more ads and more marketing, it becomes harder for us as marketers to kind of winnow in on getting them to remember us and our brand. So what can we do to decrease competitive interference? First off, we can avoid competing advertising. It's very fascinating, but we, maybe we don't want to be in the same area. Maybe we don't want to be running the same type of ad. Maybe we want to uh, push a lot of initial learning and maybe we want to have external retrieval cues that we can give to people so they can pull it up. Those are all very important pieces that help us create a brand image um, that draws from memories and things that pull people back into the brand. So when we talk about product positioning, it, this is a decision that we make to try to achieve a defined brand image relative to the competition within a market segment. So let me translate that into English. Like, I want these shoes to hold this position and get this group of people interested. Now, those are great concepts. However, our perceptual mapping offers marketing managers a useful technique for measuring and developing a product's position. So we can do something very similar to this. We can go up and say, okay, where does our brand or product fit on a business 101 scale. So, you know, just like X axis and Y axis. We can give ourselves two things like adventurous and fun and serious and expensive and chic and economical and common. We can look that serious, expensive and chic chocolate are Ghirardelli's and Godiva. Okay, that's interesting. Whereas a Kit Kat bar is economical and adventurous and fun. It's, it's very fascinating. Um, I think that Twix isn't on here, but Twix has had a massive campaign over the last couple of years. It'd be interesting to see, where do you think Twix are? I'd say they're probably more on the adventurous and fun, and they're probably a lot more ec uh, economical and common. So I'd probably say it's up in that green blob on the top right. But yeah, every product and brand is different, so it can run from that. So when we reposition a product, it means that we've decided that we no longer want to have that. Now, let's just say, for sake of an argument, that Twix decided that they wanted to rebrand as an exclusive chocolate and that they had 100% cacao in it and that it was a very refined caramel that they used and the wafer was completely different. Like, they could change how we think and feel about that based upon how the packaging and whatever messaging they put out. So it's interesting to always remember that we can alter our brand positioning. 
And then we have our brand equity and brand leverage. So if you buy a Nike or a Payless shoe, for instance, which one do you think is gonna hold up more? And it's based completely on the brand. And then we can talk about brand leverage, which is we can actually use, um, I would say like Nike Odysseys. Then they came out with the Epic Reacts, the or the React thing, and they had Odyssey Reacts, Epics. So they, they ran off of the brand and the sole, and they created other shoes from it. So that's a good way to leverage it. So that's nine, product positioning. And I just wanna jump into 10 here really quick. Motivation. All right, so motivation, personality, and emotion. Like I said, I did my dissertation on this. I could talk about this for hours, and I'm gonna try and give you some just basics that can help you as you go through this. We're still in the same section. We're gonna talk about motivation. So motivation, I like to say, is this deep-seated core inside of you. Now, it's not, it's not what you do, it's why you do it. And I think that's an important piece there. So I got a PhD because I felt like I wanted to have that developed in my life and I wanted to please my mother, if I'm being honest, right? And so like there's a deep seated core motivation. Now this is not in the text, this is just extra for you. But I typically look at the three main motivations. There's a fourth one that's kind of hidden. People are motivated by people, performance, or process. They want to develop a relationship with a person. They want to accomplish a result. Or they want to create meaningful order in the world. Now, there's a fourth one that's kind of in the middle of those, and I call it perspective. That means that they want to be flexible and adapt to a situation. Um, but a motive is a construct that represents an unobservable inner force that stimulates and compels a behavioral response. That's really important. There's a physical manifestation typically of what happens and provides specific direction to that response. And yeah, there are a bunch of different theories on motivation. The one I subscribe to is um, Elias Porter. He developed it in the 50s and refined it in the 70s. And But we have, uh, we're gonna be talking about Maslow and McGuire in here. There, there are different reasons for all of these things and I'll, you know, it just serves you well to understand most of these. I would say you wanna study a lot of motivation theory if you're a good marketer, because you're gonna see what people think drives others. <clears throat> so Maslow's hierarchy of needs, hopefully you've seen it's the pyramid. It's a macro theory designed to account for most human behavior in general terms. And McGuire's psycho uh, psychological motives is a fairly detailed set of motives used to account for specific aspects of consumer behavior. So we're gonna talk more about McGuire than we are about Maslow, but I would argue there's also Porter in there, because uh, I did my dissertation on it, that would break it down into three basic theories. And I think that's served me very well as a marketer is to think of it in one of those three terms. All right, so McGuire talks about uh, the cognitive, there's, there's four of these, the cognitive preservation motives. And this is that we need to have consistency and it needs to be active and internal, that we need to have attribution for attribution theory. Like we, we need to like tie things to other things. We need to categorize, we need to like put things in order. And then we need to, uh, for objectification, passive and external. So we need to like make a, a, a decision on something. Then we have growth. So that first one was preservation motives. Then we have, if we're gonna grow, we, need, uh, we have a need for autonomy. We have a need for stimulation. We have a telelog uh, telelogical need, and then we have a utilitarian need. This is if the person wants to grow in intelligence. Now we have affect, and we talked about affect as emotion, so I just want you to remember, this is like an emotional preservation motive. It's the need for tension reduction, the need for expression, the need for ego defense, and the need for reinforcement. That last one's really important. I think that people really want to feel good about what they've done. And so as a marketer, we should never miss the opportunity to help reinforce the purchase decision. Now, one of the experiences I had um, was that in, <laughs> sorry, it just went blank. I had a really good, oh, um, a good story. <laughs> there it is. In my earlier life, I went out and purchased a Mercedes. Love that car, it was a fantastic car. 
And I really loved, the thing I loved about Mercedes is outside of the car, the dealership was amazing. The salesperson was amazing. The service afterwards was amazing. They had so many things that made me reinforce that I made a good decision. For three years after I bought that car, I got a birthday present every year in the mail from the from the salesperson, and it wasn't like a crappy card. It was like a Swiss Army knife that was a Mercedes branded thing. Like they sent really cool gifts, and every year I was like, "Wow, this is pretty amazing." So um, every time you would take it in, if you needed to for your, like your oil change service, they wouldn't even question you. They would automatically for like an oil change, they would set me up with the new version of the current car that I had. <laughs> Very smart because it made you want the new one, but it was also telling me, man, I made a good decision here. Mercedes is taking care of me. Uh, this is why I paid a little bit more was for this service. So that reinforcement can be a very powerful tool for us as marketers. And then we have the emotional growth motives. So need for assertion, the need for affiliation, for identification, for modeling. We want to feel emotionally attached to a lot of things. We might not even realize that we want to have that emotional attachment, but everybody wants to have an emotional attachment to something we typically all have something that we are we remember fondly a memory that we have that brings an emotional response up and it's very good to to think about that as a marketer so that we can give people that um, that positive feeling so when people are purchasing we have latent and manifest motives in a purchase situation so a manifest motive is that clothes are stylish and come in a variety of sizes and colors so i want to go purchase j crew or their clothes are high quality and comfortable, so I'm gonna go purchase J. Crew. Or a number of my friends wear J. Crew clothes. Okay, those are manifest motives. I wanna do that so I can do that. Or if there's latent motives. And I think a lot of times we, um, we don't wanna say this. In fact, the little dot says that the consumer is reluctant to admit these. That is very good information. And I think that a lot of times we can dig into fear, which we're not gonna talk about tonight. And if we can find the real things that people are worried about and address them ahead of time, we automatically create a bond where we're, we're talking to that person, they trust us. So our latent motive potentially for buying these clothes is that it will show that I'm sophisticated and trendy. We're gonna learn more about our idealized self in a future chapter here. And it's an upscale urban look that will help make me powerful and popular. Okay. Now, um, I'm gonna just tell another story about a student. I think I might have shared this already, but he was in the class, we were talking about this. He goes, I don't think that is the case. And I said, well, why are you wearing an Oakley shirt? And he was like, well, you know, because it fit and it was cheap. <clears throat> and I like it because it's a good quality thing. And I was like, okay, but why Oakley? You know, like, why are you wearing Oakley? I mean, you've worn Oakley shirts till the three or four of the classes. <clears throat> and he fought with me for that whole night and said no. So I said, fine, that's your, your life. You're telling me there's no latent motive. Well, two weeks later, he came back and he said, oh my gosh, you were right. I think that I do have brand identification. I think there is a motive back there. So that's, that's the kind of power that these things can have. And we can be very blind to it. I always like to say denial is the first stage. Okay, we don't want to tell people that we're doing it. So um, when we have... A marketing strategy that's based on multiple motives, we have what's called involvement. And that's an emo a motivational state that causes the consumer's perception of a product, brand, or advertisement that's relevant or interesting. So consumer involvement increases attention, analytical processing, information search, and word of mouth. Now I wanna just tell you about um, a an interesting approach that was given to um, an experience I had. So I went down to a BMW drive event. This was, 15, 20 years ago. And I took my wife and you could sign up to, it was totally a marketing stunt, right? But you could sign up to drive a brand new 5 Series or X5. And um, and then they had threes, but they had all their cars there. So you could go on this course and they had a, dry, a professional driver there that would teach you how to drive this car around their course as quickly as they could. You got five or six laps. And Long story short, my wife went around one of these corners as fast as she could. She was supposed to hit the brake. She hit the accelerator. We didn't flip. She took this 90 degree turn in this five series BMW. And from that point forward in my marriage, she's always thought BMWs are amazing, okay? And, and so what an incredible way to get her involved 
and to motivate her to see something differently that she would have never thought about if she hadn't gone down and drive, driven that car. So there's three types of motivational conflict, approach, approach. So this is a choice between two attractive alternatives. Do I want ice cream or yogurt, <laughs> right? So like that. There's approach avoidance motivation conflict, which is a choice with both positive and negative consequences. If I do this, this positive thing could happen. If I don't do it, there's a negative. Or avoidance avoidance, a choice involving only undesirable outcomes. Like a lot of people say, oh, I'm gonna vote for the, you know, the lesser of two evils. So these things can all happen. Um, when we have differences in regulatory focus here, um, our, our motives can really, um, I, I just think motivation is such a key term, okay? So if we wanna promote something, we'll have hopes and wishes and aspiration. If we wanna prevent something, then it's an obligation. It's a responsibility. And some of those characteristics are like, if it's a wish or a hope or an aspiration, it's gonna have a long-term focus versus a prevention focus is gonna be very short-term. And, and so we just wanna really keep track of why someone is, you know, what is gonna be part of that process for them to manifest that motive and then how they're gonna go about uh, making that decision. So um, if you, for example, are trying to look at, <coughs> excuse me, a specific type of marketing, then provoke prevention focused ads work really best for last minute shoppers, okay? So they're, it's like, hey, we want to do. Um, we want to have make sure that you know you get there on time and that it's safe and secure. Whereas a promotion focused ad is going to be like, hey, I just need a vacation. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the beaches ads that they run on TV or sandals, something like that. It's like all inclusive. Come have the love life that you've always wanted with your spouse or your significant other. So that's very promotion focused now. Motivation is one thing. Then we get into personality. And personality is an individual and an individual's character response tendencies across similar situations. I like to call this behavior. I don't know if that's exactly what they would say here, but motivations are the energizing and directing force that makes consumer behavior pur purposeful and goal-directed. The personality of a consumer guides and directs that behavior chosen to accomplish in different situations. So those are like the actions that we're gonna be taking with that personality. So we can have a bunch of different traits and there's a five factor model that we're gonna talk about here in one second. And those five basic traits are formed by genetics and early learning. And so um, if you have a single trader approach, which is consumer ethnocentrism or a need for cognition or consumer's need for uniqueness, we could just say, hey, um, do you want to have the best watch that no one else in the world has? Right, that might be a unique value. Or do you want to have the best phone no matter what? Like consumer ethnocentrism, I'm an Apple ethnocentrist. <laughs> so I don't want anything but Apple, right? So there's a very, like I could look at all the things, but I'm not buying an S20. I'm not buying a Pixel. I'm just in the Apple ecosystem. So that's probably what's gonna happen. So when we look at the five factor model of personality, there's these five. You can go ahead and read up about these in the, in the book, but these, these can make up our personality a little bit better. How extrovert are we? How unstable are we? How agreeable are we? What's our openness to experience? I always like to tell, uh, to tell the story in class, at least that my wife says she's spontaneous, but will not eat at a new restaurant unless I make her. And every time she fights me on it. And then every time she enjoys it. And then she's like, oh, we gotta go back there. But I, I always tell her, you would have never found that if we wouldn't have been open to that. So it's, it's always interesting just to, to focus in on that. Uh, we've talked a little bit already about me and my Apple consumer ethnocentrism, but it, you know, it does, it reflects an individual's difference in consumer's propensity to be biased against the purchase of foreign products. So I'm not saying I'm ethnocentristic when it comes to like buy American versus Chinese, but I am when it comes to a brand, like I would, if I was being honest, I probably prefer <sighs> Nikes over Adidas that one goes back and forth. But those two brands are above all the other shoe brands. I, I keep trying to buy some Under Armors, just haven't been able to pull the trigger on that one yet. Um, but yeah, then, then we have the other two that we talked about, the need for cognition, which is like, oh, we wanna you know, engage and enjoy thinking about something, uh, consumer's need for uniqueness. I think that 
it's always important to someone to feel like their purchase was special. And so, yeah, sometimes consumers choose products that meet their, their uh, personality, and other times they try to bolster an area of their personality where they feel they're weak. So that's totally fine. So brand image is what people think and feel when they see the brand name, and brand personality is a set of human characteristics that go onto that. So doTERRA, um, hopefully people think doTERRA is an ethical company. It's you know one of those things that when they see it, they feel confidence that everything's been done right. Our brand personality, I'd say that we're a fun company that's loving and caring. You notice I'm, I'm putting these like characteristics that are human, that we wanna embrace people. Um, that would be a brand personality. And so when we look at that, we have sincerity, excitement, competence, sophistication, or ruggedness. Now, before we go into anything else, I just want to say, <clears throat> imagine if you walk into a company and you say to them, well, what's the brand personality? And they're like, well, what do you mean? We don't, you know, we don't really, you know, we're, we're, we're a good company, right? They say, so like, and you can then say, well, let's talk about what level of sincerity are we when we talk to people? Are we down to earth? Are we honest? Are we wholesome? Are we cheerful? Are we formal? Are we excitement? Are we daring, spirited, imaginative, up to date? Um, you know, so you can put these characteristics in there and really help marketing a marketing department <clears throat> frame what that brand personality is going forward. So hint, hint, nudge, nudge. This is a way to make a really good first impression if you're working in a marketing department. And then when we want to communicate, well, how do we do that? <clears throat> well, there's three different ways here that the book gives. You could get some celebrity endorsers. Now, if I said, no offense to anybody I'm gonna mention here, okay? So I'm just pulling things out of my head. But if I said that I wanted to come across as sophisticated and intelligent, would I use, I don't even wanna say it, but would I use like Kim Kardashian? No offense, Kim. I'm not saying you're not sophisticated and intelligent. Or would I use, if I wanted to, let's do a positive one. Would I use, if I wanted to have someone that felt sincere, and relatable would I get Jennifer Garner, right? Like those are celebrity endorsers that we can then kind of insinuate into the brand that their personality is part of us, ours. So emotion is a very important part to all of this. It's what people are feeling, which is typically referred to as affect, okay? So affect is that concept of, okay, what are what is the emotional feeling that's coming across from there, that? And typically emotions are strong, relatively uncontrollable feelings that affect behavior. Have you ever found yourself crying at a commercial or laughing hysterically at a commercial? Like those are, those are powerful pieces that can make people remember. And unmet needs create motivation, which is related to the arousal component of the emotion. So we could say maybe someone's not feeling fulfilled in feeling recognition in their life, right? We could fill up that hole if we used it right. And our personality also plays a role into how intense that emotion is going to be as we put it out there. So, um, you know, there's an environmental event and a mental imagery of that event that goes into the physiological changes. It's interpreted as based as emotions based on situation. Um, if I was to tell you, I'm not really interested. You and I are talking and, and I say, I'm not really interested. And you're like, oh, okay. Now, if that was someone telling me right before that that they are in love with me and that they want to spend time with me, I'm like, I'm not really interested. Like, the emotion changes dramatically if I'm just like, yeah, I'm not interested. To, I'm not interested. And so there's three basic dimensions of emotion that we want to remember in advertising. Pleasure, arousal, and dominance. Now, if you're not touching on one of these three things in a marketing campaign, you're probably missing the boat. Uh, I had a fun one last last semester where all the students were challenging me with commercials and trying to see which one that it hit, pleasure, arousal, or dominance. I'll tell you that it's there in all of them, okay? So you're gonna find one of these three things in any effective ad. And it's because the emotion arousal as a product benefit comes in and we, we can see that like it ties in the marketing to something we can relate to. So gratitude or the emotional appreciation for benefits received is a desirable consumer outcome that can lead to increased consumer trust and purchases. Now, I, I hinted at this, and this is not in the book, so this is like secret sauce right here. But as part of the emotion, there are there's pleasure, arousal, and dominance, right? 
Now, the opposite of pleasure is pain. And I would say that part of what you could do is pull out that fear or pain that someone's gonna feel and address it. Now, it's, it's a really interesting thing because you don't wanna be a Debbie Downer, but if you don't mention it, then they've got this like secret in the back of their head. And I have found it very effective in my time here in the marketing world that if I can go through and make a list of everything I think the person's scared of and what's an internal fear is what I like to call it on my teams. We'll spend 10 minutes talking about internal fears. And right when you think the, the well is getting dry, someone will say something and everybody kind of gives a weird giggled laugh. And, we'll, and that's when I really think, okay, we're starting to hit on something. And I'll give you, I think I've already shared this, but we were talking about um, one of my students wanted to do a tattoo parlor and one of the, he wanted to, uh, um, to market to um, 20 to like 25 year olds on their second tattoo. And we were all talking about what are some of the fears. And um, one, of the, one of the women in the room, she said, well, I'd be scared you'd be perving on me. And everybody kind of giggled. I'm like, ooh, there it is right there. Okay, so that's a legit thing. So we put that in his marketing. It was a really great move because it was like, you know, professional. No one will be looking at you or you're just here to do your art and all this kind of stuff. Now, that can automatically generate that emotional trust that I think is needed if you can address it and then like mention that it's there and then talk about how you solve it. So I've always found that to be very, very productive. Um, and I think that what we need to just realize is that the consumer emotional intelligence is an important determinant of the effective consumer coping. Okay, so it, it's how much are they going to be understanding their emotions within our products? And, and that's a big deal. You know, I, I, you see kids at the store just melt down and cry if they don't get what they want in a purchase. We're all like that. We're all like that. There's some deep-seated need down there saying, you should get this product. And then there's another need that comes up and says, no, you should buy a house. Or, you know, like, no, I need to save for this. So it's competing. We just need to figure out how to address that. Now, motion can enhance attention, attraction. It can, you know, create maintenance in an ad that people watch longer. Sometimes when you get really choked up, you remember something. So Microsoft two years ago, uh, you should go out and look for the Microsoft 2019 Super Bowl commercial. It was all about video games. It was about kids with disabilities and how they have an adaptive controller that allows them to play like a normal person. And it was one of the most brilliant pieces of marketing I've ever seen because it took video games, which I think has a stigma of being a negative, turned it into a why wouldn't you let your kids play video games and on top of that it's it's really good for kids to play video games because that's where kids with physical disabilities can be equals if they have this controller brilliant and i mean it makes me cry every time i watch it it's really great so um you know the sometimes the more emotion we put in it the more people will come back to that ad because they like it so that was a lot i'm sorry i went really fast but i didn't want to spend too much time on this i know these can get a little, a little bit long but I hope you've learned a lot. There's so much in these chapters. This is These two chapters are like a treasure trove for your information as you move forward in marketing. I hope everything's going all right. I'm so excited that you're still here with me in the class. And I look forward to uh, seeing what you're going to write this week in your discussion posts. So um, please have a good week. Take care of yourself. And I will talk to you later. Thank you very much. Bye.